Let's do a mic check, one, two. Let's do a board check. Looks like we're good to go. So you might be wondering, why is he sitting down? And that's because I'm a podcaster. Enough of this lecture crap. I'm going to give you a podcast. And we're going to do it live. So let's get started. Hey folks, my name is Scott Weingart, and this is the End Crit Podcast. And this is a podcast for my friend John. In a bit, I'll explain why I'm giving this talk in the John Hunt section. But today I want to talk to you about meditation. Meditation has the worst PR campaign in history. started getting ruined by the hippies in the U.S. in the 70s. Now it's been taken over by tech entrepreneur douchebags. You have folks like this guy pandering it on TV. But there's nothing spiritual or woo-laden in this talk. This is science. This is cognition. This is proven benefits from something that most of us aren't doing, but we probably
he cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. So for two-year-olds, that's natural. And yet we're still doing the same thing. We're still having people choose the responses we exhibit. What meditation offers is the ability for you to choose the response you want to have to stimulus, to stimuli. It's not going to make you a blissed out stoner. It'll merely allow you to decide how you want to go about your day. Now, there's a downside to this, because all of a sudden you can't blame other people for how you react. You have to take it in all yourself. But there's also the ability to respond to good stimuli in our lives. All of a sudden, when good things are happening, we have the ability to appreciate it at a much deeper level. So if you buy that, if you believe what I'm saying, let's talk about how to do it very briefly. Now, if you're going to make this happen, you've got to buy a few things. Uh, you definitely want to get a specific set of robes for this, and preferably saffron. Um, you know, it helps to have a specially designed cushion. And the incense is optional, but I highly recommend it. And then definitely some Tibetan prayer bell of some sort. And of course, that's all crap. Here's what you need. You need some hard-backed thing to sit on. And you don't even need that. You could do it lying down, but most of you will fall asleep if you first start. So just find something you can sit in that's going to keep you upright. And then, well, let me actually take you through it. So what I'm going to tell you is, uh, is based on a book by Mike Taft, and I highly recommend it as a great source for learning how to do this in a totally scientifically based way. But let's hear from Michael how you're actually gonna perform mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness is paying attention non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. Let, let's break that down. Mindfulness is paying attention. Okay, so you have to pay attention to your present circumstance. And the way I'm gonna teach you to do that is by linking it to your breath, a thing that's gonna happen all the time without any volitional control, and yet you can take conscious awareness of. Non-judgmentally. Non-judgmentally may be the most important part of this, because as you're trying to do this, as you're trying to concentrate on your breath, you're gonna realize thoughts are popping into your head. And if you're a type A, goal-directed, smack type of person, you might get upset. You might get angry at yourself. Why can't I just concentrate? Don't do that. Just say, okay, I lost the train for a second. I'm just going to go back to my breath. Do it non-judgmentally without getting upset at yourself. To the unfolding of experience moment by moment. And that's just it. To watch moment by moment as experience unfolds. Uh, let, let's go further and actually tell you how to do that. Okay, let's all give it a shot together. Everyone in the audience, if you humor me, close your eyes. Sit up nice and straight. And just start taking deep breaths in and out through your nose. And as you do that, just bring your attention to the feeling of that breath going through your nostrils. As you're doing that, thoughts are going to go through your head. Feelings are going to go through your head. Sensations, perhaps discomfort, is going to go through your head. And each time you feel one of those things, you think one of those things, you sense that, just come back to your breath and don't get angry. And just keep doing that for the next eight minutes. All right, maybe, maybe we'll wait till you guys get home, but that's, that's pretty much it. It sounds easy to describe. It's actually much harder in practice, but you'll get better and better. And that will give you the benefits of meditation. If you can do this 10 minutes a day, four days a week, and you just keep going, that will reap enormous benefits in your life. And if you're willing to do it for a month, I promise you, you will see objective changes in the way you process and in the way you interact with people. So that's Vipassana, mindfulness meditation. Let's talk about one more meditation type. This is contemplative meditation. It's a little bit different. And where I got this from is a group called the Stoics. Now, the thing is, the Stoics are misunderstood. And uh, in fact, I'll, I'll let a gentleman much smarter than me explain how they're misunderstood. And this is actually how I got into the philosophy of Stoicism. It's a book by a gentleman named Will Irvine. Unless you're an unusual individual, everything you know about Stoicism is wrong. The common
common belief is that the Stoics were anti-emotion, and that simply isn't true. What they were against is negative emotions, emotions like anxiety, fear, envy, regret, and hatred. They wanted to eliminate those emotions to the extent possible. Stoicism is a philosophy of happiness, how to achieve a good life. And we've lost out on a lot of these philosophies that the Greeks and Romans had, that actually, instead of just meanderings of thought, which is what I find philosophy to be now, it was actually really, really common, useful information on how to live a better life. And one of the main ways the Stoics advocated to live a better life was encompassed by a practice that I've adopted. This is my son, this is my boy, Mace. He's five. And pretty much every day, for a few seconds, I visualize him dead in my arms. And that sounds horrible, but it's a practice called negative visualization. And I think if you start doing it, it'll change your life for the better as well. Let me explain. Well, actually, let's let Will explain. The Stoics, as part of their philosophy of life, devise strategies for dealing with their losses. One very important strategy, in fact, I'd be happy to call it the central strategy of the Stoics, involves what I call negative visualization. For just a few seconds a day, not minutes or hours, the Stoics thought we should periodically take time to contemplate the bad things that can happen to us. They thought by doing this, we could live a happier and more meaningful life. And I know that sounds like strange advice to make ourselves happy by entertaining gloomy thoughts, but let me explain what they had in mind. A Stoic will engage in negative visualization. In these visualizations, he'll imagine that he's lost the things in his life that he values. This might include his spouse, his children, his car, his job, his health. By visualizing in this manner, the Stoics reasoned, we could overcome the tendency that humans have to take whatever it is they've got, to take it for granted. So think about this. Have you ever been at the end of a relationship, realizing it's about to be over, and suddenly all the good things that relationship and compass go rushing through your brain. All the annoyances and frustrations disappear, and you wish you could change the way things played out. When you lost someone, you think of all the amazing things, and they just run through your mind. It was a primacy that was gone, that wasn't there before you lost them, before someone left. What if you could have that same mental reset every day while the people you love are still there? That's what negative visualization's about. For a few seconds, you visualize your son gone, and then what floods through you is an immense appreciation that he's still there. Imagine your wife leaving you so you could, in the moment, realize how important she is to you. That's the benefits of negative visualization. So, I told you at the beginning that this lecture was for John. So let's talk about why. John was one of the first friends I lost, the first contemporary. I lost grandparents, great-grandparents, but no one our age. And what I'd like to think is that my practice of mindfulness made me appreciate the time I did have with him far more than I would have otherwise. If I lived a stoic ideal, I would have told John how wonderful he was while he was still with us. I would have told him how he brightened my life each time I got to hang out with him. And so instead, I'm saying it to you now, on this podcast, in front of all of you. Our lives are short. Meditation is a way to appreciate every moment. We'll continue to lose our loved ones, our friends. So contemplate losing them each day to appreciate them more while they're still here. 
Exercise is work to live longer. Meditation is work to live better. I'm Scott Weingart for the MCRIP podcast saying bye-bye. Scott, that was simply incredible. John Hines was an innovator, someone who pushed the boundaries and refused to be held back. You've done likewise today. You've brought SMAC to the next level. Is there a ceiling for SMAC and for us as a community? Can we be held back? The people in this room just keep showing me that there is no ceiling. We're just going to get better and better. Andy, any questions, comments coming through on Twitter? So one that I thought was just quite entertaining, if nothing else, Arun Goes, hopefully I've pronounced your name right, um, had tweeted that the artist previously known is the most type A person I could, I could ever imagine. So I think you surprised people by talking about meditation, about being reflective and things like that. So I suppose one comment leading from that is, what do we do when we go to work and we start telling people we're meditating? Was that completely overwhelmingly negative, your crazy response? Oh man, this is coming out of the closet in a way, right? I, I would, this is, uh, it, it's tough to, to admit because it has so many negative associations. But it, the title of this talk, Kettlebells for the Brain, that's it. This is pure exercise. This is simply a way to make your brain stronger. And no one looks down when you go to the gym each day and lift weights or take a run. And I don't know where these negative associations are, that somehow we're weakened, that we're engaging in, you know, incest burning woo. It's not. It's simply scientifically proven exercise. And then perhaps the, the other question that was going through my head and quite a number of people are tweeting about is the, perhaps some of the dangers of negative visualization. There's a lot of people who have a lot of negative thoughts a lot of the time. Should they be indulging those? Can there be any dangers with this type of thing? Yeah, it's tough. Um, but the way they're doing it is a very stereotyped, well-wrought way. You just, you need to be in a mindful state and just for a few seconds, you visualize it and then it's over. And I don't know, I, no one's looked at whether it could lead to someone with tendencies to depression or already fear and anxiety in their life, whether it can make it worse. But I, I have to imagine that those folks are already indulging these thoughts and really negative visualizations for people that aren't thinking about it. So Scott, should we be incorporating this into our daily practice? Should each department have a little quiet room where we can go and recharge for two, three, five, ten minutes? Oh, God, the associations of that would, I, I, I don't think that's the way. Here's the way. We've spoken on stage, Mike Loria and my friends, Chris Hicks have spoken on stage about um, square breathing, tactical breathing. You might have heard it on the podcast. If you start meditating at home and then you have a moment of stress, if you do that tactical breathing with a link to mindfulness and just close your eyes and experience the same sensations you do when you meditate, just those 20 or 30 seconds of breathing have a multiplicative benefit uh, far beyond what you would get with simply doing the uh, you know, orchestrated breathing. So that's the way I would play it, not a meditation room somewhere in the ED. Okay. Scott, that was just incredible. Thank, Thank you. you very much.